Really, uh, really blessed to actually have him with us and uh, for him to share the message that God's laid in his heart uh, for us today. Um, I just like to ask, maybe, how you how you feeling, uh, Pastor David? Um, I'm not feeling that I'm going anywhere actually, <laughs> um, because this coming Tuesday I'll be back here. I, okay. um, I'm doing a training session for the group leaders in the discipleship groups in the ah. Cantonese ministry. <laughs> right. So, and, and also um, in May, uh, the Cantonese services, uh, they have invited me to come here to preach on a Sunday. So, well, fantastic. I, well, I mean, <laughs> you, to pass that would still be around to, to preach. That's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Um, but yes, it would be great that you're still here to be able to preach to us as well to, um, to finish up. Um, before we, uh, before you, uh, I hand it over to you, I might uh, I'll pray. Yes, please. Yeah, fantastic. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to give thanks for um, this time that we have to be able to um, worship you through um, your word, Lord. And so we really give thanks for our senior pastor, Pastor David, um, for his time that he's, uh, that he's had with us, Lord, um, that you've um, placed him here for the last 22 years. Thank you for um, the love, um, the care, the support, the perseverance, the passion that he has um, given um, to your ministry here during this time, Lord. And Lord, uh, even though that um, he's ministering here, the season here is coming to an end, Lord, we just uh, really pray for um, his, um, I guess, to see his, as he continues his next ministry and uh, at his new church, Lord, that you continue to um, give him that uh, passion through your Holy Spirit to really serve you and the people um, of your kingdom, Lord. And we just pray that uh, he'll continue to really um, you rely and um, and. and, and um, and uh, rely on your strength as he um, goes through this time of transition. Uh, it's a big change as well for himself. And Lord, um, we just pray that, um, yeah, you, uh, that you give him much um, um, peace, uh, much wisdom, and uh, much strength as he goes forth um, to uh, and trust in your plan, Lord. Well, I also want to um, pray for uh, CBC as we um, uh, go through this time of transition, Lord. We just pray that um, you give us open hearts and minds in terms of in this time of change uh, that we. Um, yeah, we continue to, um, despite, I guess, the, the things that might be moving around, Lord, that um, you remind us that it is you that we are here to um, serve, Lord. Uh, it is you that uh, tells us um, and guides us um, in um, where this church needs to go. And we just want to lift these things up to you and pray this your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Wilson. And thank you, everyone, for your prayers. Um, like I said, I, I don't really feel that I'm going anywhere yet because... Um, I'm just starting to take some leaves um, uh, tomorrow, that is Monday. And um, according to the deacons, I have accumulated a lot of leaves. So my official uh, finish date in this church is 21st of August. Um, <laughs> and and the, uh, um, in the next uh, seven months or so, I'll be here from time to time. Like I said, Tuesday, I'll be here. And then um, 10th of February, uh, I'll be here at the Cantonese morning service because I have promised the worship team that I'll play bass guitar for them. And then uh, at the ordination of Pastor Daniel Sin, I'll be here. So um, uh, we, we still bump to it, uh, into each other uh, uh, quite often. Um, it has been a, a very interesting 22 years as I look back. Um, and then I was thinking, what is sort of the, the last word that I, that I leave with central? Uh, and of course, this is not the, just the last word, but um, I'm thinking uh, uh, something that uh, I want to leave with the church. Um, so I thought about re rediscovering Christ's mission for his church. So, so that, that is what I want to talk about. Um, in fact, I, I want to uh, say something else first. Um, if uh, uh, Kevin to help us to go to the slide that shows um, a, a quotation from Kierkegaard. I, I think it would be the last second or last third slide. I want to uh, um, reverse the order because I was thinking um, would it be the last word? No, that's, yeah, yeah, that's right. Th this is the one. Um, because I was thinking of the role of a pastor, role of a pe preacher, role of uh, people in the church, 
And Kierkegaard is a philosopher, Christian philosopher and theologian in the 19th century. And he said this regarding pastors and preaching and sermons and so on. He said, people have an idea that the preacher is an actor on a stage and they are the critics blaming or praising him, you know, so according to whether they like your message or not, they think the preacher is the actor on the stage. But then he goes on to say that what they don't know is that they are the actors on the stage. And the preacher is merely the prompter, standing in the wings, reminding them of their lost lines. So you are the actors and the actresses. I'm just someone standing at the wings next to the stage. Somehow when you forgot your lines, I remind you. Somehow, when you skip some of the lines, I would remind you, that's all I have been doing for the past 22 years. And so, it also reminds us that each one of us should be reading the Bible. Each one of us should have that close relationship with the Bible, with, 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 with our God. And each one of us should know the mission that Jesus Christ has given to us. I'm not giving you that mission. I'm just reminding you that this is from Jesus Christ, that this is from the Bible. All right, thank you. Let's go back to the first slide there. So what is the mission of the church? What did Jesus want us as his church to do? The first thing we have to understand is the gospel. What is the gospel? Because the the, the the mission of the church comes from the gospel, and the gospel comes from Jesus Christ. And so if we know again what the gospel really is, then we would know what the mission that Jesus Christ has given to us. And so the first thing is the gospel is a personal faith in Jesus Christ and a loving relationship between God and us. So what is the gospel? What is Christianity, you could put it this way. Christianity is not just a time of worship. Christianity is not a set of doctrines. Christianity is a personal faith in Jesus Christ. Christianity is a relationship, a relationship between God and us. And if we all understand this, the rest of it would come so much more naturally. But then we, we all know this basic foundation, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We, we, we would share the gospel with people, and this is almost the first verse that we share with people. This is a, a, a gift of grace. This is absolutely grace from God. We did not earn it. We did not struggle to, 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 to make it happen, although there is a part that we have to do. But it is all grace from God. But somehow I feel that a lot of times we don't really understand what grace really means. Now, sometimes we, we should say, well, we're all Christians already. We know Jesus Christ, so we know grace. We, we know what is the gospel. But then there is one piece of misunderstanding many, many Christians have. We thought that we, we got this faith and salvation by faith, and that, uh, and that is where grace stops. It is the grace of God. We cannot earn it. it is, uh, we don't deserve it, so this is grace. But then we thought that after we have been saved, then we should grow in our Christian life, we should grow in our understanding of God, we should grow in our understanding of God's Word, we should grow in our service to the Lord, and we forgot that this is all grace still. We thought that this is on our own, we do it. So I would do it, I, I'll make myself grow. I would serve the Lord. And sometimes we really have forgotten that this is also the grace of God, that we can grow, that we can understand the Lord even more. And the, the difference it makes is that we tend to think we should take over, and then we should clean up ourselves and become holy and pure according to 
the Bible. We thought we do it ourselves. Like I said, of course, we do have our part to play, but we really have to understand that this is grace too. Otherwise, this kind of distorted, wrong thinking could be devastating to our souls. For one thing, we thought everyone else should do it yourself, DIY, you know, we all should do it ourselves. Because we, we, we don't like to owe anyone anything, even to God. Well, all right, God, you, you have given me such grace, I have received faith, I have received salvation, that is all I want to owe to you, that is all. And to grow and to serve, it's my own business. And that means whether I want to grow or not, it is my business. Whether I want to serve you or not, that is my business. You know, that kind of thinking could really thwart our growth. And the other thing is, if I don't think I deserve the grace of God, I don't think anyone else in this world deserves the grace of God in our Christian lives and ministries. And so when we come up to face people who are in difficulties, when they're in trouble, when they're in depression, when they have problems in their ministries, we thought, you have to take care of yourself. It is your problem. It is not my problem. Well, maybe if it's God's problem, it's not my problem. It's your problem. And so we, we, we refuse to give grace. We refuse to show grace. We can be very strict with people. You know, what kind of Christian would we be if we lack grace? So we really have to understand that through and through, from the start of our salvation, right through our sort of sanctification, becoming holy and like Jesus Christ, it's all through, it's the grace of God. And so that means we should not just teach people about set patterns of behaviors because it's very, very dangerous. We have to know that this is sheer grace, the next one. And it means that the gospel is grace too. To grow in Christ is grace too. Otherwise, we would have especially, uh, I'm not... Uh, um, only thinking of the Sunday school teachers, but uh, they always find themselves um, easier to fall into this kind of trap because we thought, you know, little kids can't understand abstract concepts and ideas, so we have to make it simple, make it concrete so that they could understand. And so we transform the gospel of grace into rules and set patterns of behaviors. You should do this, you should not do this. And especially, this is church. You should not do this in church. And you know, this may not happen a lot in the international congregation because there aren't too many babies. We've got lots of babies in the Cantonese congregation. And, you know, when I walk past, the mom would always say, behave yourself, pastor is coming. And I said, I'm not the police. Don't make me police, <laughs> right? And so they, 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 these kids, from young, they develop a negative image of pastors. Have you done that? Did your parents do that to me in front of you? I have seen so many parents do that. And so we have negative image of the police, negative image of pastors. You know, in my previous church, someone said, the young people always try to avoid the senior pastor, especially, especially the senior pastor. Right? They don't like to talk to the senior pastor. Why? Because of the parents. So Sunday school teachers easily fall into that kind of trap. And then when the children grow up, they grow up with this kind of wrong understanding. We grow into religion rather than growing into the gospel. And so we really have to show grace and not just set rules and patterns of behavior. 
There are lots of acts and lots of stories of grace. We have heard of a lot of them. And that might help us to understand a bit more. There was this woman. She has been in jail. She has been with different men. And then she actually had three kids with three different men. And then one day she decided to go to church, find out about Jesus Christ. Certain people in the community knew about her and her backgrounds. And it seems that nobody was willing to talk to her. She kept coming to church. She kept coming to try to seek who is Jesus. But for a period of time, nobody wanted to talk to her. Until one day, one lady in the church started to talk to her, tried to understand her, and showed some compassion and uh, helped her to understand what is church and what is gospel. And this is grace. You know, in our lives, we are taught to judge these people. We are taught to shun them. And our parents would say, don't go near them. It's bad influence. You know, sometimes it hurts us too when, when in the church we actually heard these kinds of comments. A long time ago in one of our Bible study groups, this guy came in and, and somehow we knew about his background, which is not too favorable, not too positive, but somehow he came. And I guess it was because his wife was a Christian. But she doesn't come to this church, she goes to another church. And the guy was at the brink of divorce, and maybe because of that, he started to want to go to church and find out about church and find out about Jesus Christ. And somehow, some people in the church knew about him. And they actually said to the Bible study group, try not to talk to him. Don't befriend him. He might ask you for money. We doubt his motivation of coming to church. And somehow it was even said something like, it is best he doesn't come to church anymore. Where is grace? So, you know, because this is the gospel, the gospel is grace. And the gospel is not just our salvation that talks about our believing in Jesus Christ and, and, and having eternal life and getting the license and the passport to go to heaven. It's not just that. The gospel is grace. From our salvation to our growth, our sanctification, it's all grace. And so what does that mean? What is the implication for the mission of the church? It means that the church should show grace to anyone, and especially sinners, because that is why Jesus came. He came for sinners like you and me, even though we have not murdered anyone. You know, I kept telling people that I'm actually a serial killer. I have killed so many people because Jesus said, when you get angry with them, you have killed them, you have murdered them. Put up your hands if you have never murdered anyone. <laughs> We're all murderers, serial killers. And so you got that sheer grace from God and then you refuse to show grace to others. But that is the gospel. That is the mission of the church. And then some people think, oh, yes, of course, that is the mission of the church. So the church would do that. You know, sometimes we refer to the church as something apart from me. When we come to church, we say, I'm part of the church. When the church should be doing what Jesus Christ said, like the Great Commission, we should all make disciples of all the nations, the church would do that. You know, the church would do that. So what does that mean? The church would do that. That means the pastors would do that. The missionaries would do that. Maybe the deacons would do that. Maybe Wilson would do that. I don't have to do it because the church will do it. 
You remember what is the church? Well, we always say that the church is not this building. The church is not even this space, this place where we worship. What is the church? According to the Bible, the church is people. People. People who, who, who have become disciples of Jesus Christ as we come together. This is church. And so you are the church. When you come together, you are the church. And individually, you are the temple of God. So when you say the church will do it, don't think that you don't have to do it. Because you are the church. And that is the mission of Christ's church, to show grace and love and compassion. It's not easy to do it these days, but I'm sure you can do it. And secondly, we have to go on to the second level. The gospel, which is a personal faith in Jesus Christ and a loving relationship between God and us, that is the foundation that is the main foundation, that is the most important foundation. And then we go on to the next one, we see that the calling of the, of the cross is self-denial. That is part of the gospel too. The gospel is not just happy, happy, I'm now a follower of Jesus Christ and so I have eternal life, I'm going to heaven when I die. Well, of course, all that would happen, but that is just the first level, the ground level, the foundation. And a lot of us are happy to just stay at level, uh, level one, or even the ground level, even just the foundation. We don't want to build on it. But Jesus said the gospel is not just one level. The gospel includes the second level. The gospel includes the calling of the cross, and the calling of the cross is self-denial. That's Mark chapter 8. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Forever, for, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So this is the calling of the cross. This is the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the cross of Jesus Christ where he sacrificed his life for you, where he laid down his life for you, where he bled for you, where he redeemed your life. And whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Sometimes we, we, we seem to think, I'm a Christian, but I may not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know how contradictory we can be because this is good for us. Right? I'll just be a Christian. I won't be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But when you come to see Jesus, he said, well, what is a Christian? A Christian is one who follows Jesus Christ and one who follows Jesus Christ is a disciple of Jesus Christ because the word disciple means a student, a follower. And so you would take up the cross you will take up the cross. What is the cross? The cross in the New Testament, in the Roman Empire, is a symbol of death sentence. And so when you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, there is a death sentence. But the good thing is our old self and all our sins are nailed to the cross and I'm a new person. So that is a good kind of uh, death sentence. So who said capital sentence is not always good? Who, who, who said capital sentence is not right? Well, usually it's not right, but this kind of death sentence, it's good. Good for me, because I'm a new person now. The, but, the, but then when we, when we follow Jesus Christ, the cross is also love and sacrifice. That is the cross, because Jesus Christ loved you, because Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for you. And so to deny yourself means to put aside your aspirations and ambitions and desires and to take on the ambitions and aspirations and desires and the whole will of Jesus Christ. That is self-denial. Sometimes when we look at this word self-denial, does it mean that I will lose my character, my personality, my ego, 
And that is not good because modern psychology say, no, this is not good. You have to be yourself. So how can I lose myself? But the Bible says you don't actually lose everything in yourself. The good thing is you put aside yourself and the, the life of Jesus Christ, the will of Jesus Christ will come into your life and it will fill your life. You change for the better. You're transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And that is self-denial. And what does that mean? That means Christianity is a suffering faith. You know, we, we don't talk about suffering in Australia. This is a developed country. We have religious freedom. So we don't talk about suffering. Well, the Christians in the early church in the first century, of course they have to suffer because that's the Roman Empire. That's the pagan empire. And the, 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 um, the, the Israelites in the Old Testament, of course, they have to suffer because, well, uh, uh, they didn't obey God, and uh, so Israel was destroyed, and they were uh, 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 captured to Babylon, and so they lived in a pagan nation, and so they had to suffer. But we, we're in Australia, the lucky country. We enjoy religious freedom. But then we all realize that religious freedom is not a must anymore in Australia. Just the past week, if you have heard from the news, someone is introducing a bill into parliament to restrict religious freedom. Did you hear about that? Especially the safe school program. And the bill wants to take away the exemption of uh, a, 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 a schools run by our churches. They want to take away that exemption. So no private school, no uh, a Christian school can say no to the safe school program. And you all know what the safe school program is about. And we really think that it is not very safe. It's not safe to our young people. It's not safe to our next generation. It is not safe to our next and next and next generation. But somehow the tide is turning. You look at the census information, you know that uh, even 30 years ago, we have a large percentage of people who identify themselves as Christians, and now the percentage is falling, and the numbers are actually reducing and we actually would be seeing a lot of opposition. We're actually seeing this kind of attacks. I, I don't know whether we should now start using the word persecution in Australia because you're a Christian. But there will be, there will be more and more difficulties identifying yourself as a Christian and upholding Christian values values of Christ's kingdom. But this is the mission of the church. We have to learn. We put aside ourselves. We put aside our comfort. We put aside our aspirations. Are you willing to allow the will of Jesus Christ come into your life and take hold of your life? And even in the face of such kinds of restrictions, there may be no more exemptions for Christian schools. I don't know, uh, even in the future, maybe no more exemptions for Christian organizations. In, uh, in America, they call these faith-based organizations. We have our principles. We want to hire Christian people who would uh, uh, abide by our Christian principles. And then someone said, no, this is not right. Men are all equal. Right? And so to be equal, to be just, to be fair, your organization should be hiring just anyone. You can't put Christian faith as a restriction. 
And I don't know whether somehow that would also develop into saying, are you a Christian church? No problem at all. You have to hire non-Christian people. Because this is equality. And so we are going to face a lot of these opposition. So as Christians, we know that we have to abide by the will of Jesus Christ, but it's becoming more and more difficult. And so what, what's the implication for us? So let us go back to level one. Level one is our personal faith in Jesus Christ and our loving relationship with a loving Father who really loves you. And so we have to know the heart of God. God's heart says He really longs to fill whatever space we make available to Him. He wants to come into your life. Is there a space for Him? And of course, sometimes we take this personal relationship as an excuse not to go up to the second level because, well, my faith in Jesus Christ is my personal relationship with Him. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with the church. So don't you worry about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And so my faith is a private faith, and my faith is a privatized faith. I won't have anything to do with any social issues because my faith is a personal faith. And you know how wrong that can be. Christian faith is not a privatized faith. Christian faith is always a public faith because that's the value of God's kingdom. Love, sacrifice, justice, fairness, righteousness. Although our brand of fairness and equality may not be the same kind as other people in this society, but we know where we stand. And when we face these kinds of difficulties and opposition, let us go back to the foundation. Let us go back to the heart of God. But we don't stay there at the first level. We go on. We have to, have to, we, we have to, to uh, um, go back to the foundation. We, we have to allow God to fill our lives. We, we want to be near to God because God wants to be near to you. But then with this strong faith foundation, we go on to the second level. And that is, we show the world our calling. We show the world that the cross is self-denial. And finally, there is a third level. The third level of the gospel is freedom and liberation for the oppressed. That is a biblical meaning of the gospel and the mission of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about them spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. I'm not preaching about putting, laying hand of, uh, uh, on the sick and praying for them, and then they, they would get up and walk. This has happened in the Acts of the Apostles, according to the Bible. But my emphasis is Jesus comes to release the oppressed, and free anyone who is under oppression. There is another verse in Luke that we have just read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the people. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. 
Giving sight to the blind is one kind of liberation. Helping those who are poor, helping those who are prisoners, that is the good news of liberation and freedom. Anyone under these kinds of circumstances, Jesus Christ has come to proclaim the good news to them. And Jesus read this when he was in the synagogue. He had the whole Old Testament that he could read, and he chose this one because this is the mission of Jesus Christ when he came to earth. And so his mission is the mission of the church. And so his mission is your mission, it is my mission. Our mission is not just to pray so that someone can walk. Our, 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 our mission is not just to, to give out freebies and money so that those who are poor uh, will find help. Our mission is to liberate so that we can be free, free in many different ways, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. That is why Jesus came. So are we living a gospel that heals and liberates and gives freedom? This is Christianity. Now Jesus has given us, the church, this mission. How Central Baptist would carry it out, every church would have their own uniqueness, Every Christian would have their own spiritual giftedness. But we have to be serious about finding what Jesus wants us to do. And so in a sense, God has called me to serve somewhere else. After 22 years here, I felt that God has given, this, the, God, God has given me this conviction that I should go somewhere else, I should move on to do something else. For those of you who would continue to be here, I pray the same prayer. I go on to somewhere else to carry out the mission of the church over there, and you continue to carry out the mission of the church here in Central Baptist Church. Last week I had um, a very interesting meal with a very interesting friend and uh, sometimes he comes to worship with us sometimes he doesn't because he fly all over the world he's a very important person with the Baptist World Aid and I, I, I went yum cha with him and um, he sent me this poem written by the Archbishop Oscar Romero um, I think yeah I think it's here Yeah, that this poem, I find it um, so inspiring, right? And I wanted to share with you what he has shared with me. We are prophets of a future, not our own. We can do certain things. We may not be able to do everything. So Central may not be able to do everything. Certainly, I can't do everything. But then this is a very good reminder. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. Next one. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow, even though we don't do everything. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning. A step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. I think there's one more line. We may never see the end result, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. I find this so inspiring. It also talks to me in such a way that 
Even after 22 years, I've only started to do the beginning. You know, like when the, um, the four runners of this church, 182 years ago, they started this church in Bathurst Street. They have started, and it's just the beginning. And all of you here, you will carry on the mission of Jesus Christ here at Central Baptist Church. And may the Lord and His Spirit be upon you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. And that is why you sent Jesus Christ to be our Savior. We thank you, wonderful Lord. You are the head of the church. And we thank you for your love and your sacrifice for each one of us. You have laid that foundation of grace. And may we all grow into your grace. May we carry out your mission as you have come to this world to start your mission. And in fact, Jesus, you have said that we will do bigger things than you. And Lord, we can see that your spirit is guiding us to do bigger things. And we pray that Central will do bigger things. Each one in our lives will do bigger things. Bigger than what we have been doing yesterday. Help us, Lord, in small steps, even though small beginnings, we will carry out your mission. But Lord, help us not to stay at the ground level. Let us build on it. Let us not take the personal relationship as an excuse. Let us build on it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.